Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Grooming Your FICO for Real Estate Profits. This is professional real estate investor David Campbell, and joining me on today's event is credit expert Wayne Sanford. Hello Wayne. How are we doing? Doing fantastic. Wayne and I have known each other for a couple years, and I have personally retained uh, Wayne's company to assist in uh, improving my personal credit score. And I can give the best testimonial I can give to uh, someone is to say, this is who I use uh, for this service on my personal investing. And this is who I refer to our clients. Wayne does a great job. He's the smartest guy uh, in this space that I know. And I'm really looking forward to learning something on today's event. So just a little bit about myself. I am a professional real estate investor, but I never, I didn't start that way. I, I started as a high school band director, and uh, that was about 12 years ago that I got started in real estate. And it took me about seven years to make my first million dollars in real estate. And then in the eighth year, I made a million dollars in, in one year. And it's really possible for people to start out just working an ordinary job starting with no assets and to become a multimillionaire through the vehicle real estate. And that really is my passion is teaching people how to create a better financial future, starting with relatively modest, uh, modest resources. Uh, I've been a, a developer, real estate developer. We've developed houses, condo conversion, have experience owning multifamily winery, resort office, medical office, uh, I'm very fortunate that I have been able to present on the Summit at Sea with Robert and Kim Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, along with several other Rich Dad advisors, Ken McElroy, Tom Wheelwright, etc. And it's a great uh, honor to be presenting to you today. I met Wayne about three years ago in Dallas, Texas, uh, where my home building company is located. And at the time, Wayne was introduced to me as someone who could be a resource for buyers that were credit challenged. And that's how Wayne and I met. And since realizing Wayne has got a lot of depth, a lot more depth than any other credit expert I've ever met. Wayne's been, uh, has written articles for AOL, Finance, CNN Money, Dun & Bradstreet, Fox Business, Yahoo, Money Magazine. And what's really impressive is he's one of the only, if not the only, uh, people certified by the Texas Real Estate Commission to teach continuing education to realtors about credit issues. So there's a lot of people in the credit repair space and the credit expert space, and most of them don't know what they're talking about. Wayne is one of those few exceptions. His company, New Start Financial, they've been around for eight years. They're licensed and bonded. Uh, he's a Kaplan University instructor, instructor, and according to Wayne, you may tell me about this last point. Your clients see how much of an increase? Uh, the average customer we typically come across really is going to see a 50 to 150 point increase, usually within the three to six month time frame. Obviously, everyone's slightly different, but what's kind of crazy is the lower the credit score, the easier it is to get 150, sometimes 200 point jump. That is fantastic. That is a really big deal. That could take someone from being unfinanceable to being financeable. And in today's real estate market, you can, in theory, if the lender would do it for you, you could buy positive cash flow property with no money down. And if you could get that uh, credit score up, sometimes that's the only thing that's preventing someone from buying the property that they need and getting out of the rat race is that credit score. And so today's uh, information is powerful, right? There's a lot of the information that you can implement yourself. Some of this information is not intuitive. You've got to learn it. But once you've learned it, it's not rocket science, right? So the other thing is if you really have a big need for credit, uh, Wayne's company, you can retain Wayne's company to assist you in getting your, your credit score up. I really want to encourage everyone to stay to the end of today's presentation. We're giving away some free gifts. And when we get to the end of today's presentation, you're really going to find out about how to get some free uh, content that could potentially change your life. So big disclaimer, this is not a substitute for getting your own professional advice. Although I'm a licensed real estate broker and Wayne is a credit 
expert. You are not our client simply by watching this video. So there is no client relationship or fiduciary relationship created between uh, Wayne and myself and you as the watcher of this video. All right, that's a big long disclaimer to really say you're not your advisors, so you can't sue us. If you would like to retain us as your, as your advisors, that's possible, but that relationship is not created through this video. So hassle-free cash flow investing is the brand that I've created, and I really believe that our mission and my personal mission as a teacher, as a financial educator, is to help you re increase your return on investment. So we all want more profits, but we all want more profit with less money invested, less time invested, and less hassle invested. We want more profit with less invested. And one of those ways to make your experience hassle-free is to make your expectations in line with reality. And so Wayne is going to go through the credit game, and it is a game. Some of the rules don't make any sense. And the great part of today's presentation is helping you reset your expectations of what the credit game is like so that you can make your future reality powerful, right? I've had some heartbreaking stories of people in escrow to buy properties. Their earnest money is no longer refundable. They get to the closing table and the lender says, I'm sorry, we did a final credit check and your credit no longer qualifies you for this loan. Your loan is denied. The seller wants to keep the earnest money and the buyer just is demoralized because they thought everything was fine, but then they made a last minute really bonehead decision with their credit and they really shot themselves in the foot. So a lot of today's presentation is preventative, how to prevent from being a credit bonehead. And the second is how you can really get yourself in position to make money from using your credit score. So Wayne's going to teach us what a FICO credit score is, why you need a FICO, how to improve your FICO. And finally, we're going to wrap up with how to use your FICO for real estate investing profits. So Wayne, take it away. What is a credit score? Sure. Uh, basically everyone, a credit score is really just a snapshot of your credit risk really at that point in time. Technically a credit score is really called a risk score. And 90% of the time when you do pull your credit, your credit scores are not static. What I mean by that is if you went to go uh, pay down a couple of credit cards because you know that that uh, is an issue for your credit, and then let's say a week later you go to purchase a car and your credit score happens to be a 640. Well, most likely that credit score is probably closer to a 660, 670, or maybe even more. But the problem is when you pay a bill, the creditors do not race to tell the credit bureau that you've paid. So it's going to continually the it's going to continually change as information changes. There's a commercial on the radio you hear where they say, you know, we're going to insulate your credit score. That's impossible. You don't control the information that goes in and out of your credit. So how, therefore, how can you insulate it? And it's not part of your credit file, and it's just not stored. Every time, think of it like a mathematical equation. And I just had a Red Bull earlier, everyone, so you'll have to forgive me. It's a mathematical equation. As information gets put in and added and changed, your scores are constantly changing. So that's really the first phase. Now the next, let's see if I can correctly use this thing here. I pressed the button, Dave, just like you said. Okay, great. So where do credit scores come from? There are actually hundreds of credit bureaus throughout the United States. However, the major institutions use pretty much the big three, which is TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. In the Southwest region, Equifax actually utilizes a company called CSE Credit Services. So if you ever challenge something and you get something from CSE Credit Services, that in essence is your Equifax credit report. Wayne, something that was uh, eye-opening for me when we first started, uh, I think we had a lunch together and you're talking about credit and a light bulb turned on for me, which was that TransUnion, Experian and Equifax are private companies for profit and the customer is not you and I, it's all of the creditors who pay to subscribe to the TransUnion Experian Equifax service. And so the for-profit company isn't really there to service you and I and make sure that our credit report is accurate. 
they're there to serve the creditor and to do whatever the creditor asks them to do. Expound on that point. Sure. Like we said, a credit score measures uh, payment history. It's got the ability to tell that lender, hey, what are the odds of you paying their bills? Therefore, in essence, someone that's a customer that is continually paying. By law, there is no law that actually states that if somebody report, or, let me rephrase that. There's no law that requires somebody to report information on your credit. However, the law stipulates if somebody does report, that information they're reporting is 100% accurate. Okay, so businesses pay a monthly fee on top of numerous other fees to the credit bureaus to report this information. When you and I as a customer, we go to check on that information, obviously we're in essence really a secondary customer, but their main core business is dealing with collection agencies, banks, and other types of uh, creditors of some sorts, and even collection agencies of all form that are reporting on your credit. So as I always tell everyone now, obviously this is my opinion and just because it's my opinion doesn't mean it's not true and sometimes it goes against, well federal law says this but they do something else and let's face facts, just like the book that I wrote, The Real World of Credit, we live in two worlds, the real world and the perfect world. So as a business owner, if you have clients, don't you in a roundabout way feel an obligation, David, to protect your clients? Absolutely. So therefore there's a lot of different times and the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and I'm actually going to be doing an article with a uh, gentleman from the Dallas Morning News in the next few weeks. He actually was a victim of this situation, and he wants to do a report going, how do the credit bureaus get around the Fair Credit Reporting Act? And there's sections, and I'm deviating a little bit, but this is kind of important. The Fair Credit Reporting Act in certain areas is so loosely written that you can tell that it was written in the favor of the credit bureaus that I'm sure have lobbyists and you know how you know that's just the world that we live in so it's you know it's one of those things that's why I tell everyone this is a game I don't care how you want to think it I don't care how you want to look at it this is a game unfortunately it's a big game for you especially for people that are looking at getting involved in investing you're utilizing your credit as a leverage tool to help purchase properties and acquire wealth yeah when FICO, F-I-C-O, Fair Isaac Company, and when I first read that, I thought there was something fair about <laughs> FICO, and there's nothing fair about the FICO. And as a real estate oh. developer, I carried back a mortgage in 2005, and that mortgage went bad in 2008, and I went to, I had to foreclose on the property, and I wanted to report that person to the credit bureau, right? Because mm -hmm. they weren't paying, yeah. and that's just not fair that they're not paying. Let me report them to, uh, and, and put a make negative mark on their credit score. Well, guess what? I couldn't do it. And I thought, that's not fair. Because my company was not a huge lender, and we don't pay the fee, more importantly, we don't pay the annual fee to uh, subscribe to be a member of these bureaus. We were Monthly, not actually. Monthly. There you yes. go. <laughs> yeah. And when, in order to actually report to the bureaus, just to give you an idea of how it basically eliminates the little guy, is you have to have anywhere from, depending on the company, 100 to 500 active rolling accounts. And this goes on, you know, sort of behind the sub, uh, behind the scenes in subcategories. But every time, and this is something, Dave, I, I just came across that I probably would, you should know too. Every time a consumer disputes something it's going to obviously cost the credit bureau's money because they have to go through that process. Well, they're trying to figure out a way to outsource it to make it even cheaper and then charge the creditors for every single time somebody disputes something. So they're trying to figure out a way on how to make money from credit disputes. Mm. And very interestingly, right now, the situation is if I dispute something on my credit, the credit bureau wants to make it as hard as possible for me to jump through that hoop because they don't make money now. They don't make money from my uh, dispute at all. And there's no motivation for uh, Fair Isaac Company to make sure that my credit report is necessarily accurate because the information is one way. It's from the creditor who pays for the monthly service to Fair Isaac Company and, uh, I'm sorry, the other, the bureaus, I should say. And um, it's up to me to monitor, to make sure, to be the watchdog to make sure that that information being reported is accurate. And Wayne, 
how many credit you've you've seen it, how many credit reports have you seen thousands tens of thousands i'm over 11,000 right now 11,000 credit profiles what percentage of those profiles when you looked at them for the first time were 100% accurate zero isn't that amazing everybody <laughs> 11,000 credit reports and none of them were accurate, but that report controls your entire real estate investing career, or at least your ability to get conventional financing, right? The conventional financing isn't the end game. Uh, it's not always required, but most people get started using conventional financing. And so learning the game and playing the game is so powerful in your, your success. And if you're listening to this call, statistically, your credit report is wrong. There's an error on your credit report that could be making you pay a higher interest rate or preventing you from getting the financing that you deserve. There's also a little tip, um, and you know, it's just a backtrack for a second when you said about Fair Isaac and Company. The loaded question is, well, who is it actually fair to? Obviously, we know it's not the consumer. <laughs> yeah. But the, um, what a lot of people, and here's one thing that a lot of people have a great, great, great misunderstanding. If you have a negative collection that's five years old, by law, in two years, it's going to fall off whether you owe the money or not. Now, just because it falls off your credit report of whatever in whatever capacity doesn't mean you still don't technically owe the money. But considering the fact that everybody looks at your credit report, if let's say you won the lotto, you, you had a big cash flow that came in, and you wanted to quote unquote do the right thing. And the running joke is, you know, hey, if you won the lotto other than going to Disneyland, people just, I'm going to pay my bills. Well, if you paid even a dollar on that five year old collection, it's going to restart that seven year clock, keeping it on another seven years in addition to the five it's already on. So it'll stay on a total of 12 years, where if you actually did nothing, it would have fallen off in two more years. So the system is really designed to penalize you. Or quote unquote doing the right thing. That doesn't seem fair. Well, yeah, that's well, that's the unfair part. <laughs> Who yeah. is unfair, Isaac and Company? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Okay. Um, so as we go into that, who is Fair Isaac and Company? They were actually the developers of the mathematical model and equations used to actually determine credit risk for the three credit bureaus. Now, we won't go into this into detail, but there was a huge lawsuit that lasted about four or five years that the credit bureaus actually won. They developed their own mathematical model. It's called the Vantage Score. So a lot of times, if you buy your credit report directly from the credit bureaus themselves, you're actually not getting a FICO score, which is what every lender in the country looks at. You're getting their own model. So be very wary of that when you're actually getting your credit score. And it's got a completely different uh, scoring model. So, But obviously, with the big three, like we talked about, TransUnion, they have their version called Empirica. Experian is actually called Fair Isaac. They're not exactly the most original. And then Equifax uses what's called a Beacon score. So what's interesting is that all three scores can be different because the data that they collect is different and the mathematical algorithm that they used to mash that data together is different as well. It's going to be different. It's going to vary slightly. Plus, at the same time, a question some people realize is, well, why are my credit scores varying so much? Well, once again, we talked about if there's a huge variation, there's different requirements. If I'm a collection company and I want to start reporting to the credit bureaus because that's my leverage tool, I have to actually pay a fee, but I also have to qualify. Well, sometimes the smaller collection companies they just don't want to bother with it, so they may only report to one or maybe two credit bureaus. Therefore, if you have a score that's a lot lower, if there's not just a flat-out error, it may be that you just have a few more collections on that one bureau than the second bureau. You know, something that happened to me in the real world is I had a lot of mortgages that were paid on time, and that mortgage company only reported to two bureaus. And that third bureau, it didn't, I didn't have positive credit with that third bureau. And so the two agencies that were getting the positive remarks from the mortgages that I was paying, that score was actually substantially higher than the one that had no information reported to them at all. That would be the reason. So, okay, let's continue. 
some of the latest news and credit, obviously from an investor standpoint, you know, if, if you have bad credit, you've got the house on the market, you know, do you want to rent it? Uh, that's always an option. Uh, the biggest thing out there right now, David, is not one of the biggest, but it's popular, is the owner finance. And I know you do cover that, correct? I don't know if we're going to cover that today. No, we're not. Okay, just want to double check. Uh, new credit scams. God, there's there's one everywhere. A few years ago, the FBI actually started what's called Operation Clean Sweep, which is more what they're trying to do is to clean up a lot of these uh, collect um, these credit repair companies out there that are just flat out just lying to customers. They can't guarantee to remove negative information from your credit. That's the main thing. And as a credit company, we have to instruct the customer, hey, technically there is nothing you can do that we can't do ourselves. However, like I always tell everyone, there's a big difference between disputing and getting results. And more so now than ever, it's no longer from the bank's perspective. It's not just about your credit score these days. Now they are looking at within the credit profile. So over here at New Start Financial, one of the main things that I do is when I look at the credit reports that uh, come in onto my desk, I look at it from two perspectives. Number one, can I get the score where it needs to be? 99% of the time that's not the issue for me. It's is there anything else here that's going to prevent uh, the underwriters from red flagging the file, whether it's a DU approval, a manual approval, or any other characteristics that pop up that will you can have I had a customer a couple months ago, got him to a 730 credit score. There was a certain code that was in the credit report, and the bank actually said no to the loan. It was a three hundred and thirty thousand dollar home. They were putting down a hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So the term skin in the game was obviously well received there. So we had to fix a few things last second, but we got it cleaned. But that is just a prime example of the credit uh, the creditors out there are, are no longer just looking at your credit score. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned the new credit scam was a couple of years ago. Everyone hopefully has heard the term piggybacking. What that means from a credit perspective, and everyone's probably done it to some capacity, is you have a family member that has had a credit card for 10 or 20 years. They added you as an authorized user and put that on your credit, and next thing you knew, your credit might have jumped anywhere from 50 to 100 points in a month. Well, that actually happened in Florida, where it was a gentleman that had a 520 credit score. He paid one or two companies, or probably just the one company, about $2,000 plus dollars, and they added some of these trade lines to his credit. Basically, they sought out people that have had credit cards for anywhere from 20 to 40 years, perfect history, and they paid them a fee to add them on as an authorized user, thus actually absorbing and borrowing their good credit. Well, the gentleman's credit score went from like a 520 to a 720 in about 45 days. He was able to get the house. Somehow the news got a hold of it. There was an article written. He was all excited. However, in today's market, it just went viral, and literally within about 48 hours, Fair Isaac shut it down. There was a big uproar because the main reasons why you use authorized users is because your son's going away or daughter's going away to college. They need an emergency credit card. That was the reason it was primarily used for. And what they started doing was trying to close the loophole. There was a big uproar. They had to re uh, re-instituted uh, back into the system. However, they made some modifications. So it helps your credit, of course. However, it doesn't help it anywhere near as it does normally. And a lot of lenders nowadays, if they see an authorized user, they're disregarding that from their business model. Uh, so, but a lot more stuff. But Dave, I know we only have like a half hour. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go on. Let's well, tell us, Wayne, how do you put the credit score together? I mean, how, how does the, 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 how do the credit bureaus determine what's important to them and what's not important to them? No one's going to uh, give up sort of the key to the vault, so to speak. However, what has been released is what we have on the screen right now, a very good, solid general rule of thumb. We call it pretty much the five factors of credit. The breakdown on that is obviously we talked about what is a credit score. It's a three-digit number that tells somebody how you pay your bills. So therefore, the biggest component of that should be payment history. Paying bills on time, good, not paying bad. That is worth 35%. The other major factor that is going to be a risk factor for lenders, um, well, actually, let's go into this one in a little bit more detail. So it's approximately 35% of your score. 
It covers all sorts of accounts such as your credit cards, store loan accounts, which is retail accounts, installment loans, car loans, mortgages, even student loans. So anything that you are developing or making payments on, it is going to reflect on your credit if that company is reporting to the credit bureaus. Okay, so obviously a major component. The second next biggest component is going to be your balance ratios. How much money you owe, how much is too much. Remember, a credit score is a risk score. The lender is trying to figure out if you use your credit wisely. Okay, so that is going to be 30% of your score. Just with the two, you are now looking at 65% of the overall credit score. This one here, Wayne, is really uh, a powerful one because I see people screwing up this one here on accident all the time. Like payment history, mm -hmm. it makes sense. Do you pay your bills and do you pay them on time? The common right. sense. This one, the amount owed, you said a magic word, which is ratio. It doesn't have as much to do with how much you owe, but what's the ratio between the amount of available credit that you have and how much of that credit score that you've used? Could you talk a little bit more about that concept? Sure. Well, here's the funnier thing is, like we talked about, a credit score is a mathematical equation. Well, if you have a $100 credit card limit and you own $90, you're 90% maxed out. If you have a $1,000 credit card limit and you own $900, guess what? You're 90% maxed out. If you have a $10,000 limit and you own $9,000, the system is reading as that credit card is 90% maxed out. Now, a good solid general rule of thumb is keeping it approximately 30%. The advice that I typically give for investors, depending on what level you're actually at, is really you want to have between 15 and 20%, at least prior to acquiring another property where the bank is going to actually look at your credit. Understand that, like we talked about, your credit is a risk score. They want to see, number one, do you pay your bills on time, but are you crazy or are you a little bit reckless with how you utilize that? We had a gentleman that came into the office a couple of months ago, and he was a victim of the mortgage meltdown, and he was in Michigan. He literally had about $90,000 in credit card debt where he was actually using his personal credit cards to fund the building of the homes. And he was doing fine until, obviously, the, the meltdown hit, which threw him into a big flux. So that obviously caused him a little bit of a problem, but getting back on track, which I always have a tendency not to do, <laughs> keeping all the balances below 30% is always going to be good. That is a tolerable risk for the banks. Let me give you an example that happened to me in real world. Um, you know, at, at one point in time, I had about $100,000 of credit card lines and I paid it off every month. And then lo and behold, once, you know, I had a particular credit card that was having a 0% uh, for 12 months um, uh, situation. So gotcha. not really thinking about it, I went and they maxed out that credit card. Because it's 0%. Why would you yeah. not borrow money at 0%? So I went and I maxed that credit card out. And then what happened is my other credit card companies saw that I had maxed out my credit card with Discover. And so then American Express went and cut my credit line. Just overnight, they cut it from about $25,000. They cut it down to $2,000 without mm. calling me, without asking me. I didn't miss a payment. I didn't even have a balance with Amex. They just saw a risk factor of me maxing a credit card out. And it wasn't a risk factor at all. I was just trying to be clever and use that 0% um, rate for a period of time. And, you know, then what really happened is that that changed my global line of credit availability and it, it became a, a, a mistake where ultimately that 0% credit line cost me more and opportunity costs than what I saved in, in interest. So what, what I tell a lot of my clients is when you don't need your credit, that's the mm -hmm. time to build your credit lines. <laughs> you really want to get that amount of credit line higher and higher and higher. I met so many very, uh, you know, very conservative clients that say, I don't want to have my credit line higher than what I need. And I think that's just so silly because the moment that you need the amount that you think you need, 
you're going to max out your credit cards and you'll have a negative credit impact versus go get way more credit line than you really need. Then when you use the portion that makes sense for you, 10, 20% of that available credit line, it's not a negative or a derogatory credit. What I always tell everyone is, and it's really funny, everyone knows credit. Now, obviously, everyone that's going to be listening on this and downloading it, everyone knows that their credit's important. And for people listening, it's going to be a little bit more important because we're trying to use this as a leverage tool to acquire some wealth. However, everyone knows it's important, but they never realize just how important it is until they need something today, and then it's too late. As And there's so many different things. It, it's such a... It's almost like a game of chess. Like that's why we joke around that we say it's a game. Is obviously, you know, someone wanting to loan you money at zero percent interest. Why in the world would you not? And financially, that's a very smart move. However, if it's going to affect what you're going to do, just because it's good for one category doesn't mean it's necessarily good for a second category. Which is why in the second part, where we just tell people pay off the debt rather than move it around, meaning balance transfers. Now, if you do happen to have a couple of credit cards. And one of two of the credit cards, let's say, are ninety percent maxed out, and one is is not maxed out, or it's at zero or five percent. Then, if you don't have the funds to pay things down, then we got to maneuver. So then, it might make sense to take thirty or forty percent, or maybe thirty percent from each credit card on the two ninety percent, and then make everything sixty percent maxed out across the board, rather than having one zero and two ninety percent. So you know that's you know. I tell everyone a credit file is like a thumbprint. Every thumbprint is going to be different. Just like you said at the beginning of this, you know, this is just overall advice. We are not, um, you're not our clients. For the people that are listening, we're just trying to give you as best, uh, as much information as we can based on really no information, especially for me. Unless I look at a credit report, I can't tell you. All I can do is speak in general terms. Yeah, your situation will always be different and so this is general concepts like you were saying uh you might have three credit cards one maxed out and two with zero balance and you max the one out because of you think it's a low rate from a uh, interest rate perspective that makes sense from a credit perspective you were saying it could make sense to take that one maxed out credit card and do balance transfer to put it equal on the all three credit cards so that you're at a 33 percent uh loan to balance, or sorry, balance to line ratio, mm -hmm. rather than having uh, two paid off and one at uh, fully maxed. That makes sense from a concept, but what if you're not going to use your FICO right away? What if you're not going to, you have no plans to, you know, use your credit score for a year or two, and you're already at an 800 FICO? Well, then maybe it makes sense instead of working on getting your credit better, you just work on making real dollars by having all of that balance loaded on your lowest interest rate. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, if you're at that, if you're in that 800 range and you're not really needing uh, your credit for anything, I mean, like I said, there's there's really no need. Utilize that credit. If, you're, if you have the ability to start building something for yourself, utilizing that credit score, you don't have a whole lot of debt, or even if you do to a degree but it's not really hurting you, utilize that leverage. It's I had a couple of customers that I talked to earlier today that they wanted to get started. And you know what? Obviously, life happens. I can't start this week. I got to start in two more weeks, two more weeks. And I call it the diet syndrome. And I just say, listen, I understand your situation. However, I just want to make sure that as long as I tell you this, my conscience is clear. We've been going back and forth for, let's say, six weeks. And what's most likely going to happen is you're not going to get started for probably another month and a half. And then once you get started, literally with most customers I come across when that have this problem, three weeks into the program, something happens where they need their credit, David, today. And they are beyond desperate. And I'm forced to tell them there's nothing we can do because we just started. And if you would have listened to me three months ago, you'd almost be done. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a bullet point on here, Wayne, that mm -hmm. very interesting. It's counterintuitive to what people think. Don't close your unused credit cards as an effort to try to raise your credit score, or for any reason. Why would someone not want to close their unused credit cards? Well, you get a lot of people that, and let's say for the Dave Ramsey watchers and the Susie Orman watchers, while I understand the concept, you know, they're basically, you know, be debt-free, live debt-free. 
Well, we live in a credit-driven society, and like I joke around and tell people, you know, if I made ten million last year, like those two did, I probably would say the same thing. But most consumers out there, majority of consumers, need to utilize credit of some capacity. And even even the the ones that follow that thought process, well, guess what? Most people don't have thirty or forty grand to put down for a car to buy it free, you know, buy it in full, let alone a house. I also think it's a ridiculous. I mean, you, you brought we're digressing, but that Susie Orman, Dave Ramsey, live debt free concept is really ridiculous because mm -hmm. with interest rates on a house at three and a half percent, and the rate mm -hmm. of inflation is three and a half to five percent. If you didn't borrow, if you are borrowing money, good debt, I should say, if you have good debt, because that's what they don't differentiate, it's the difference between good debt and bad debt. Good debt makes you money, bad debt makes you poorer. Right? You can borrow mm -hmm. money and invest that money at a higher rate of interest and you're making a profit spread. That's good debt, right? If yep. you, even a, on your home mortgage, a three and a half percent, you know, money and inflation is 5%, the inflation is paying you to be a borrower you're getting paid to be a borrower so living debt free in an inflationary society does not make uh it does not make it good sense. yeah it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and you know it's one of those you and i could probably go on for hours just talking about you know the concepts of you know what actually is behind the marketing machines of what they plan but yet like i said i do digress so let's get back to don't close unused credit cards to raise your credit score. That will literally have the opposite effect that's going to be mentioned in the next two or three slides. Think of your credit score as a number that tells people, like we mentioned before, how you pay your bills. If you have a 750 credit score, and let's say the only thing that is on your credit are five credit cards. And between those credit cards, each one of them has 20 years worth of credit history each. Well, that's 100 years worth of good credit history that is creating that 720 credit score. Well, if you close one of those credit cards because you just haven't bothered using it, or let's say you close two, well, you are now removing 40 years worth of good positive history because a credit score tells people how you pay your bills today with the accounts that are open that you can utilize on your credit today. So that's one of the main things, and that's what catches a lot of people off guard because they figure, hey, I'll pay this credit card off and then I'll close it out. And I counsel people all the time. Listen, if you have that one credit card, you don't like it because it's a, you know it's a store card and it's 43% interest, but you've had the thing for 25 years, don't cancel it. Unless they're charging you a yearly fee, which you can probably get a you know get away from or get them to credit you, don't don't do it. I mean, it's just going to have the opposite effect of what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. And I, then I, of course, yeah. if you have those five. So if you have those five credit cards, then obviously the very bottom one, don't open any new accounts just because you're going for the holidays. This gets hit all the time. You want to save 15% by opening up a Target card or whatever the case may be. It's not worth it. Okay. So let us go if I can press the right button here. Okay, great. So credit length history, just what we started talking about. The, the score, uh, the phrase, should I say, a seasoned borrower is a strong borrower really aims here. So this is going to be approximately 15% of your score. So with the other two plus this, we are now up to 80% of your overall credit score. So this basically scores considered the age of your oldest account and the average age of all your accounts. If I had a gentleman today that was at a loan officer's office and the gentleman had like a 705, a 680, a 682, but you look at his credit, other than maybe two or three credit cards that were maybe 60% maxed out, everything is perfect for him and you would think he would be more of a 750 range but if you look at the details of the file a little bit longer most of his credit cards or any mortgages that he ever had it was only two or three years old so most of the credit cards was only two or three years he just got two cars so even though all of his credit was literally almost perfect he had very little history so without that history it doesn't give you as much of a higher score as you want here's another uh... You know, digression on this point, which is you were talking about the mortgage meltdown. A lot of people have done strategic defaults or non-strategic defaults. They decided you know they couldn't afford their life and they went bankrupt or just stopped paying on things. I have talked with so many clients that say, I wish I had kept one credit card mm -hmm. yep. from that uh, that 
that meltdown, right? Maybe they defaulted on 95% of their debt. They wish they had kept one credit card safe and paid timely on that one credit card because now that their credit is ruined, they can't get another credit card. And when they go to reestablish credit, they've knocked out their entire credit history. Um, so it's harder for them to reestablish credit versus if they have that one credit card that had a long history open, uh, and they use that credit card responsibly, even though the rest of their debt they defaulted on, that one longer uh, history credit card would have helped them reestablish their credit uh, faster. The problem with that, unfortunately, is just like what you said happened to you where you you know, you know maxed out one card just to take advantage of the 0% and then Amex came in and, and cut you in half or actually cut you by 80%. Yeah. Creditors can actually look, if you go delinquent, remember guys, a credit score is a risk score. So when lenders are reporting, they're also, don't don't kid yourself, they're taking a peek at what the heck else is going on with your credit. If they see you strategically defaulting, obviously they don't know, they just see defaulting. And if you're paying them perfect, well guess what, it makes a lot of sense for them to think that they're probably going to be next. So if you owed $2,000 or $4,000 but there was a $10,000 limit, they see that as we're going to lose another possible six thousand dollars. So let's cut that ten thousand dollars down to let's say forty five hundred, which obviously takes your credit uh, credit um, ratio from being what forty percent, let's say, to now ninety ninety five percent, which is going to drop your credit score even more. So it's almost a domino effect that you have no control over. And obviously, that's where we throw in the what's fair about Fair Isaac. <laughs> okay, the next one, the different types of credit. Is it a healthy mix? You could have, now this is 10% of your credit score. And this is going to consider, obviously, the different types of credit card accounts to retail, to installment, mortgage loans, finance company loans. If you had someone that, David, let's say had $100,000 worth of debt, or let's just go a little bit higher, 150, and it was all credit cards because I've seen that before. But then you have someone else that has maybe a small home, a car loan, and then some credit cards, but their total debt was $150,000. Well, they're going to have a much higher credit score than the other person just because of the types of credit. And there's a mixture. There's, you know, you've got it's some of that debt, or most of that is secured by property, or by real property, should I say, where credit cards, you know, they can take back the house, they can take back the car. They're obviously not taking back the underwear you bought last week. So that is going to be 10% of the score, whether it is a healthy mix to some capacity. Now, the final one is actually going to be inquiries. Did I press the right button? Yep. There we go. Okay. Inquiries, I'll, now this gets a lot of hype. A lot of people think inquiries hurt them a lot more than it actually does. Okay. There's actually four different types of inquiries. The, the one that we're going to talk about the first is a hard inquiry, which is the one that can hurt your credit score. This is when you authorize a third party of some capacity, whether it's a mortgage, a car, a credit card, someone that is pulling your credit to check your credit worthiness to determine how much money they could loan you. Now, each hard inquiry can cost you two to five points on a credit score. However, most of the times, I really don't see that occurring. The credit system is almost built to absorb one, maybe two, maybe, hard inquiries per month on your credit without it actually getting damaged. Or should I say lowering it, whether it, and if it drops one point, then technically it was damaged. Now, automobiles and mortgages are going to receive special treatment for obvious reasons. That is the one, or should I say two items, that if you're going to purchase something, you're going to shop around for the best rate. So the first auto or the first mortgage inquiry will count. However, the additional ones, depending on different scoring models, some will, uh, you can pull 10 more or 20 more in the next two weeks, 14 days, and it won't count as a hard inquiry. It'll count as what's called a soft inquiry and will not hurt your credit score. Now, the overall, there's four types. The first one says permissible. That is what we just talked about, which was the hard inquiry. When you are giving permissible purpose for someone to pull your credit with the intention of obtaining a line of credit. The next one below it is account review. This is what we talked about when, let's say, Amex dropped your credit score, or should I say your credit limit, 
when they go in to do an account review of your history. If you were a 700 credit score when American Express said yes to you and they did an account review and you, let's say, charged up the cards for whatever reason and now that credit score just temporarily because you absorbed that debt dropped down from a 700 to let's say a 640, well from a business perspective you can kind of see American Express's eyes where they just say, hey, you're not the same risk that you were when we approved you. And it would make sense if they decided to limit their risk. However, obviously limiting that risk is a cascade and domino effect of numerous other problems that can happen to you. Now the third one is promotional. Okay, that is when you get those pre-approvals in the mail from a credit card company. And I remember years ago, this is probably David going back maybe six years ago when you know, you, all you have to do is be breathing to get a credit card. There was a gentleman I saw in the news out here in Dallas, and he actually put his dog's information because he got so tired of getting uh, these credit card solicitations. They actually approved the dogs, and he actually showed, you know, Rusty and let's say Johnson or whatever it was, and they actually showed that the dog got a credit card. So promotional inquiries, they're soft inquiries. They are trying to take a pre-approval and turn it into a hard inquiry which is permissible because you're only pre-approved and guess what if you're living and breathing you could be pre-approved but they have to pull your credit to actually approve you which becomes that hard inquiry that we just talked about now the fourth one is consumer request this is when you yourself go to the credit bureaus go to a third party company like a free credit score or the whatever the guys that sing something on the radio or TV about getting a free credit report you could do that every single day for the next year and that will never count against you because that is you checking. Now, I don't know if you can afford that, but that is you checking on your own personal credit. So those are the four type of inquiries. Three of them are basically semi-irrelevant and the, the main one, which is the permissible one, which is a hard inquiry, that is the one that hurts. Examples of soft inquiries on top of that is Insurance Score, DirecTV. Those are, those are soft inquiries. Wayne, thanks for how, how, <laughs> understand how it's put together, and it's an interesting. A lot of people think that it hurts their credit to check uh, to see how it is, but that's actually not uh, not the case. Um, so, how to use your FICO for investing, right, Wayne? You've taught us some good strategies on on maintaining a credit score and getting it up higher. Uh, and if you stay to the end, we're going to get a great uh, free gift for you on how to get a free 15 or 20 points on your, your credit score. So hang in there and we'll tell you how to get that, that free uh, 15 points on your credit score. How do you use your FICO for investing profits? There are eight essential investor resources that we teach. Cash, cash flow, equity, credit. And that credit part is really helping you establish the basis for getting financing. And so that is one of the core resources for making money. And the reason that we want to borrow money as an investor is arbitrage. We borrow money to make a yield spread. So whatever your return is, whatever the, the deal pays, right? Maybe the property is an eight cap and it pays you 8% return. That's independent of financing. And so one of the concepts that we teach at hassle-free cash flow investing is that the cap rate should always be higher than the interest rate. Another way to say that is if you're going to uh, borrow money at 4% and loan money at 10%, you're making a spread, a positive spread of 6%. That's positive arbitrage. How much money do you want to borrow at 4% and lend out at 10%? All of it, as much money as you can. And that's what banks do. So when you see a savings account or a CD at a bank that says, we're going to pay you 0.1% interest on your money. The bank is taking your money at 0.1% and they're lending it back out at 4, 5, 10, 18, 20%. And that's how the banks, why they have such fancy lobbies and such nice buildings, right? Is they're in the arbitrage game. The bank doesn't lend their own money. They take your money in through savings. They leverage it up by borrowing from the Federal Reserve and then they lend it back out at a spread. So you get to play the same game of arbitrage. You get to invest at a higher rate than you're borrowing. Here's an example of how a leveraged deal 
versus an unleveraged deal. So it's the same property, two people buy the exact same property, $100,000. After all expenses, except for debt, you've got $8,000 of cash flow or net operating income left over. It's, that means that you've got an eight cap rate. If you These numbers aren't really jiving for you very quickly. There's a great video resource on our website hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. There's a bunch of videos on real estate math that'll really make this con these numbers flow very easily for you. So on the, the left example, unleveraged, you pay cash for the investment. No mortgage payment. A lot of people think that's a great idea. So the profit from the property is the same as the net operating income, which is $8,000. Therefore, your return on investment is 8%. Return on investment... On the unleveraged property is the same as the cap rate. On a leveraged investment, you can see that you're getting that same income, but you have a mortgage payment. And we're just going to use an interest-only payment for simple math here. Your down payment is 20%. You've got an interest rate of 5%. So you're paying $4,000 a year in interest expense. And your profit from cash flow is $4,000. A lot of uneducated people will say, well, $8,000 is higher than 4,000. I would like 8,000, please. And that isn't necessarily true because in the right scenario, the leverage scenario, you've got that $4,000 of profit, but only $20,000 invested. So your return on investment is 20% instead of eight. So when you're positively arbitraged, your return on investment goes up and it goes up substantially. Another way to think about this is if you owned one house free and clear, you're making $8,000. If you use that same money to buy five houses, then you're making $4,000 times five, or you're making $20,000. So would you rather have $20,000 of cash flow or $8,000 of cash flow with the same money invested? And you know, most people will see that that positive arbitrage or that positive leverage makes so much sense. So how do you use your FICO for investing profits? Arbitrage, 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 arbitrage. Invest at a rate higher than what you're borrowing at. So one example is you borrow money to go buy a property and you rent it out, right? That's pretty simple. You could either uh, use your um, uh, own money to go uh, buy a property and get bank debt for 80%, or maybe you even borrow the down payment and you're 100% financed. In today's economy, in today's real estate market, you can absolutely get um, properties to cash flow with 100% financing. If you're looking for that kind of opportunity, our company actually specializes in working with people with good FICOs. So you got to have a good FICO and working with people to get positive cash flow properties with net no money down or with 100% financing. It's a mixture of conventional debt and private debt. And if that's something that's interesting to you, be sure to send me an email, uh, david at hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com or visit our website and fill out the, uh, uh, the investment intake form and we'll be sure to, to get you those opportunities. Who doesn't want to bring, make cash flow with no money down, right? It seems like late night TV, but our clients do it all the time. So arbitrage is seller financing where you buy a property, but you don't want to be a landlord. And Wayne was talking about this earlier, where you sell or finance it. You buy a property and then you immediately sell it and you have an interest rate spread. You borrowed the money at 5%, you sell the property and you become the banker for someone else and you collect, you charge them 8, 9, 10% and you're making a spread. Uh, the other thing is arbitrage as a loan guarantor. On a commercial property, for example, you might not need to put any of the money in. Maybe you get into a partnership where I put up the money, you sign on the loan, and you make a profit or a fee for your signature on the debt. There's a lot of reasons someone might want to have a loan guarantor on a deal. That could be someone of the high net worth, or it could just be an average person, you know, using their signature to generate income. The other is being a private lender. Maybe you have a property with equity in it. You could borrow the equity out of your property through a refinance or home equity line of credit or other forms of pledging your equity and you use that money to lend it out for a profit. Right now, if you've got home equity, you could borrow that out at 4%, maybe 5% and then lend it out for six, 
very conservative, right? Six to maybe 15%, depending on how much risk you want to take involved um, in, in, in being a lender. So Wayne and I have written some great books. These are some great uh, resources for you on my website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com slash investor dash education, or just go to hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com and navigate your way to the eBooks section. There's a book called Hasslefree Cashflow Investing. That is a free book for you to download. There's another book called The Private Lending Report on how to be a private lender. So if the idea of arbitrage made sense for you, that's great. And Wayne's got a fantastic book on Amazon that you can purchase called The Real World of Credit. But Wayne has also put together a very special report for us on getting a free 15 um, points on your FICO. Wayne, tell us about that. Uh, the title of it is called The Fast 15. And in essence, really, it's geared for the investor who, let's just say, is a 710 credit score. And to really get those phenomenal rates where it really makes good business sense, uh, they needed a 720. Well, now, like I said before, until I look at the credit profile, every profile is different, but this is a solid way to be able to, it's a couple of pages, and you can actually read and figure out a way to actually get those 15 points just by reading those two, three pages. And actually, you could get it fixed on your credit within technically five to six business days. That's awesome. So if you go to my website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com, Wayne has made that report available to the listeners of this webinar for free and that is just a great so if you have any questions for our uh, panelists it was great that you attended live and if you didn't attend live if you're watching this video you can send your question uh, either to myself david at hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com or the question is specifically to wayne you can email it to wayne at wayne the credit guy Dot com. If you have that question, go ahead and use your uh, GoToWebinar control panel to send that question in. And Wayne, what kind of questions do you typically get for uh, questions when people are talking about their credit? Sure. One of the main questions I get is if there is a collection on somebody's credit or they have actually heard it, it's, well, Collection company A sold the account to collection company B, who then sold it to another collection company. So, oh my God, I will never get away from this because they keep selling it and the seven-year clock that everyone knows about just keeps starting all over again. So that is probably one of the main questions I get asked a lot. And what people need to understand is the Fair Credit Reporting Act actually states that that seven years is from the original creditor when the last time that account was charged off by the original creditor. So they can sell it to three or four or ten different companies as long as that customer or that person did not pay one of those collection agencies during the course of those time frames, then it reverts back to the original date of last activity. So that is the big one. They think that it keeps the seven year clock keeps starting all over again. That is not the case. Now just like just because they do it doesn't mean they're not going to break the law if a collection company illegally changes that date and you know the last time I dealt with that account was 2006 and this information is saying that it's dealing with it's making it look like it was last month six months ago well technically that's illegal and that's a violation of not only the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act and a few of them but typically state law so you could actually file suit in small claims court which is a hundred dollars People don't realize just how incredibly easy it is. It actually is the people's court where you can actually go file, present your proof, which you have, and it's a $1,000 per violation. Wow. So that is, so, that's the one main question. Our, um, that, that, that's powerful. That's very powerful. Our, our company, Hassle-Free Cashflow Investing, helps clients get financially educated in a position mentally and emotionally and intellectually to become a, a a successful investor and we also connect investors to specific real estate investing opportunities both in whole ownership of real estate houses and duplexes and, and commercial properties etc and we also put groups of investors together to syndicate property and so that's uh, if you've got IRA funds or you're looking for uh, places to invest your capital you can definitely engage with our company great place to start is our website you can also pick up the phone give me a call. My number's at the bottom of the screen here, 866-931-9149, extension 1. 
Wayne, tell me how people can engage with your company. Um, obviously, since we're into technology age, it's sometimes the easiest way to get a hold of me is at Wayne at WayneTheCreditGuide.com. They, if they have a question or two for me that is something that requires a little bit more conversation, they're welcome to call me. Um, or they can just go to WayneTheCreditGuide.com and there's a little section where ask a question and they can just pop their question to me and I'll, if in worst case scenario, schedule a phone conference with them. Fantastic. Thank you, Wayne, so much for being on our webinar today. I appreciate all of you watching this event from home. We produce a uh, webinar series. Really encourage you to uh, check out our calendar of events at hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. Make sure that you get on our, our email list so that you can find out about future events like this, as well as investment opportunities. May you have great success in your investing and have a great day. Take care.